Good evening, everyone. I'm Bonnie Boisner, and I'm the president of Porton Overseas. We're happy to be here tonight to share some of our expertise with you on traveling to Norway. We appreciate everyone taking the time out of your schedules to join us here online. You know, Norway House has been so good about giving all of its members opportunities to participate in programs like this virtually when we can't meet in person. So hats off to Norway House. We're thrilled to be here tonight as part of this travelogue series. Nicole Anderson is also with us tonight. She's our Scandinavian Director of Board and Overseas, and she's responsible for leading the teams that craft journeys specifically to Scandinavia and all of the Nordic countries. So she'll be sharing a lot of good stuff with you about traveling to Norway in just a few minutes. I wanted to take first a minute and let you know who we are at Borton Overseas. We're a leading tour company based right here in Minneapolis, service, serving not only Midwest clients, but also clients around the US. We plan journeys to really five areas of the world, Africa, Antarctica, South America, Southeast Asia, and Scandinavia, with Scandinavia being the biggest part of our business. And we've been serving customers and travel for over 100 years, dating back to arranging steamship travel for Swedish immigrants as early as 1894. So we've been around a long time. We have destination specialists on staff for each of the countries we go to who are expert in knowing these areas. You know, when I say expert, not only do they travel there frequently and keep up to date with all the new things, but some have actually lived and worked in these countries. So we have a wealth of knowledge to recommend and design tours specifically for our customers. You know, Nicole herself actually lived in Norway, worked in Norway, studied in Norway. She speaks Norwegian and knows really everything about the best places to experience there. We do both individual itineraries for families and group travel for affinity groups. And we offer tours that can be either standard or totally customized for the specific travelers. And to tell you the truth, that's most of what we do is customized journeys for our customers. So that tells you a little bit about us. Now let's talk about Norway. Okay, gosh, the world has changed this past year and the pandemic has closed borders. You know, Norway's slogan today as we speak is, Dream now, visit later. And that's because right now as a US passport holder, we can't travel to Norway unless we meet some family or work exceptions. And with those come a lot of quarantine and other restrictions as well. So as a you, just a regular traveler, visitor, tourist, we can't go there right now. Now they have said that Norway will open its borders this coming June. We're watching that closely has changed a couple of times, but you know, as the pandemic has progressed, that date has moved a few times, but it's been June for a while now, so we're getting pretty confident in that opening date. So when we're looking at itineraries and travel to Norway, we're looking post-June. Now we have a couple of things going on here. We have all the people that were supposed to go there in 2020 that are now rebooking for 2021. And then we have this pent up demand of people that haven't been able to travel for a year and now want to travel. So we, when these two things collide, we may have space issues. So the clear message here now is to plan now, secure those dates so that you can travel when you want to travel. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to start giving you some ideas and some great information so you can get those ideas going in your head and those juices flowing to plan your dream trip to Norway after this June. So with that, Nicole. Hello everyone, and thank you Bonnie for that wonderful introduction. My affinity for Norway started at a young age with my grandparents both following and teaching us about our heritage. As a young adult, I wanted to visit where I came from without being a tourist, so in college I went to Norway for a semester abroad and fell in love with the country. That semester quickly turned into seven years abroad, and now I'm happy to have helped clients for their first or fifth time to Norway with Borton for almost five and a half years now. Which brings me to the main purpose of this travelogue session, giving you tips on Norway, travel to Norway, no matter what skill level you are. First, we'll go through the two main types of travel. These are escorted and independent. When people think of escorted, I found that the first thing that pops into their head is a coach bus. This is of course an option when it comes to escorted travel, but it's not the only option. We do work with partners that do small group tours as well, either on smaller buses or using different modes of public transportation, all while having a guide with you the whole trip. 
Burton Overseas also has its own variation of escorted travel that we call a signature journey. These we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Independent travel is the most flexible type of travel you can book because you can decide the itinerary and pace. Being independent doesn't mean having no guides though because you can still book guided day tours. On an independent trip, you decide what to book when and how long to stay in each destination. And if it's booked through us, we can even put together that itinerary for you, or um, when you travel, we'll provide you with all of the tickets, vouchers, as well as information on how to use them and navigate from point A to point B. Independent travel can seem scary for some first time visitors, but Norway is very easy to navigate, and there are many friendly English-speaking people along the way if you do need help. As a visitor to Norway, here are some of the biggest highlights I'd like to share. Oslo, of course the capital, has many sites and museums to visit. Among them would be Vigelandsparken, a sculpture park located within the city, outdoors in a wonderful open space. Actually, a great place to have a picnic lunch if you're interested in that. Um, the Viking Museum is also very popular. And even if you've seen it before, they're actually in the middle of renovating, not only to make it larger, but also a new type of research museum that actually provides a more interactive experience for its visitors. This is said to be finished in 2025, if you're interested in that. Um, but my personal favorite is actually the Kontiki Museum because I really like Tour Heyerdahl's story behind the Kontiki expedition. So that's a must see as well. Another of the biggest highlights would be Bryggen, the wharf in Bergen. This entire area has so much history. You can just see it in the architecture and feel it when you're walking through the unlevel buildings. Here, I would recommend taking a guided walking tour of the area just to really dig into that history. Bergen, of course, has more to offer than the wharf though. It, for example, it's a great starting point for visiting the fjords, which brings us to our next highlight. Fjords had to be one of Norway's biggest attractions. Almost every inquiry we get, no matter how many times that person's been to Norway, typically includes fjords. And of course, the most common, nicknamed King of the Fjords, would be Sognefjord. It is the largest and deepest fjord of Norway, with a length of 127 miles and a maximum depth of 4,291 feet. There are, however, fjords sprinkled all along the coastline, both in the north and in the southeast area of Norway. The fjord you can see pictured here is Lysefjord, located just outside of Stavanger. The main highlight of this fjord, also center of this picture, is Pedikestolen, or Pulpit Rock in English, which is a great day trip out of Stavanger. Two other fjords that I recommend seeing while in Norway are Gedangefjord and Hardangefjord, both easily accessible from Bergen, and um, even some of these sample itineraries later um, will encompass these. Of the fjords, Sognefjord is the most visited due to its size and views, and the most common way to experience the Sognefjord would be the famous Norway in a nutshell route. If you aren't familiar, the Norway in a nutshell is a route that uses public transportation from either Oslo or Bergen to explore the fjords, ending in either Oslo or Bergen. Going from Oslo, you start by train to Myrdal, then you take the historic Flom Railway to Flom. Flom is just a quaint little village located on a finger of the Sogna Fjord, Aulans Fjord. From Flom, you ferry through a small portion of the Sogna Fjord to another fjord town of, called Gudvangen. From Gudvangen, you board a bus that takes you along windy fjord roads to a city called Voss. And then Voss, you take a train uh, that will conclude your journey to Bergen. There are, of course, several variations of this that you can do that will fit within your personal journey. And you can even spend up to six nights in the fjords, if that's of interest to you. 
Um, now that we've covered some of the biggest highlights, I'll go over some of our most popular itineraries, no matter what type of travel you're interested in. Some examples of our most popular independent itineraries that cover some of these areas would be Norway by land and coastal steamer and Oslo, Bergen, and Norway in a nutshell. Norway by land and coastal steamer includes Bergen, Norway in a nutshell, and Hurtigruten, which has become famous for its long history along the coast of Norway. The route Hurtigruten has traveled goes from Bergen to Schirkenes daily, stopping at both small and large ports in between, carrying both people and goods. Over the years, the route has become more of a tourist destination, since it's an easy way to experience the beautiful coastline. The journey takes one week in either direction, with excursion options provided along the way. The circular route is designed to meet northbound ports at different times of the day than going southbound. So if you do have the time to do a round trip sailing, you can actually see different things in each direction. That being said, northbound sailings are the most common, so we have chosen to present that routing for you today. The itinerary starts in Bergen, where you take the arrival day to explore Bergen, and the second day you actually do a round trip Norway in a nutshell. I know the mention of Norway in a nutshell again probably has you in a plane, trains, and automobiles tailspin, How, so I won't go into the details of the transportation again. However, this route will be from Bergen to Bergen, and it's about a 10-hour experience from start to finish. The following day, you start the seven-day voyage along the coast, having leisure time in Bergen in the morning and transferring to the cruise terminal in the afternoon for an evening departure northbound. The boat provides three meals a day with a menu based off of local specialties as you sail and optional excursions that you can book either with your initial booking or on board. The boats are smaller so they can get into more scenic areas so the main focus is on the entertainment and not your standard cruise entertainment. The journey ends in Shirkinis, which is just a few miles from the Russian border. And here you'll fly down to Oslo for one night um, before departure, unless you'd like to extend your stay there to explore Oslo a bit. Prices vary depending on the time of year and that you'd like to travel. But the northbound sailing with this itinerary is an 11 day, day journey with no changes. The Oslo Bergen Norway and Nutshell itinerary encompasses arriving in Oslo, spending a day to explore the city before heading out on the Norway and Nutshell with a night in the fjords prior to traveling to Bergen for another day there where you can experience the Bre Bregen area or Goimokflayen um, before you depart. This one um, is seven days, however, it's very flexible if you'd like more time in either Oslo, the fjords, or Bergen. It's just that great starter itinerary for getting some of those major highlights. For those of you who are more interested in having a guide throughout your itinerary, um, I've provided two escorted packages here that are popular within Norway. While both encompass the fjords, Fjords and Glaciers starts by exploring Bergen, then focuses on Sona Fjord and the close by Ustedal Glacier before heading to Oslo for a day prior to departure. This would encompass Bergen, Oslo, Sona Fjord, and part of the Norway and Natural Journey, giving you a great overview of Norway. Norwegian Fjord Getaway focuses on the west coast, as you can see on the map. This is where some of the most intense fjords are. From Bergen, you explore the Sogna Fjord, then you head north to Geidanger Fjord. In addition to also seeing Usedal Glacier, it adds Trollstigen and Geidanger Fjord, which the fjords and glaciers didn't have. It, however, doesn't take you to Oslo, but this can also be added uh, for people who are interested as an independent extension for you to visit Oslo prior to departure. If you're not interested in bigger cities or are looking for a more unique itinerary getting off the beaten path, 
I've selected the follow sample itineraries from our website. The first being Lofoten Islands. The Lofoten Islands are an archipelago located above the Arctic Circle that have a rich history in fishing. This is a popular destination for Norwegian tourists year-round, but most of our travelers like to visit in the summer. If you're traveling here, we recommend you have a car because as you can imagine on an archipelago, it's a little spread out. And although there are a few museums worth visiting, most of the sites are outdoor based, whether it's hiking, kayaking, boating, fishing, or even biking. This is a perfect destination for an outdoor in the free air trip with many spectacular views. The final sample itinerary I have for you that gets you off the beaten path is Extraordinary Hotels of the Fjords. And this is honestly one of my personal favorites because it's so unique and gets you to areas you may not have been. This nine day itinerary starts in Bergen with a day to explore before embarking on a self drive to Hardangefjord, Sognefjord, Nordfjord, Gerangefjord, and then it ends in, not a fjord, but Olesen, the coastal city. Now that's a lot of fjords, meaning a lot of spectacular views, and we haven't even gotten to the best part. The tour is designed around historic hotels, and it just really gives you a beautiful historic experience in Norway. Now that we've gone through those sample itineraries, I did mention earlier that Borton Overseas has a product we call a Signature Journey, which is a small group uh, tour, escorted tour led by one of our destination specialists. Annually, we have a signature journey that travels to a Scandinavian Christmas market, so you can do some unique Christmas shopping. Biannually, we have a signature journey that chases the northern lights in a Nordic country, and this summer we're repeating one of our most successful journeys, Swedish Midsummer, to celebrate the holiday in the countryside of Sweden. Like I said, they all have a theme and one departure date. With one of our destination specialists as your guide for the entire trip, so you can experience a new culture or destination with a familiar guide. We generally cap these at about 20 participants per journey to keep it a nice small group feel. And uh, this December, we're actually going to Trondheim to experience the Christmas markets there and in a nearby mining town of Ruros if you'd like to join. To close out, I wanted to share some tips. Uh, with you based on some of our frequently asked questions here at Borton Overseas in the Scandinavia department. First, um, when to plan. Scandinavia doesn't require a long lead time for planning as some destinations do. With a valid passport, you can technically plan a few weeks in advance. However, we recommend planning six to nine months in advance uh, for the best pricing and options uh, for air, um, accommodation, and tours because they can fill up too. For air, a good route if you're going from Minneapolis is taking Iceland Air. It's a low frill airline that um, has a direct route from Minneapolis to Reykjavik and then over to Oslo or Bergen. However, if you're interested in a little, a few more frills, um, Scandinavian Airlines and Delta offer options um, sometimes with a a less direct routing. Um, since it's a good time to plan, um, if you're looking to go this summer or um, fall even, um, budget is also something to consider. Um, on average, we find a two week trip to Norway runs a person about $5,000 uh, $5, for the trip. Um, this obviously varies based on what you choose to do, where you're flying from, your preferred accommodation, but it's a good reference point. Um, what is the best time of year to travel? This depends greatly on what type of weather you enjoy and what you want to see. If you want to see northern lights, you need to go in the winter. If you'd like to see colorful fjords, you should probably travel from May to August. The busiest travel period um, we experience is from June to about mid-August. Um, so some people choose to go slightly before or after this. Um, another question we get is 
money exchange. Where do we do that? Um, how much to take out? Um, the Scandinavian countries have kind of gone in a large part paperless. And in this case, um, that means that they use mostly cards for their transactions. Um, so we don't really recommend taking out a large portion of cash, but just in case your card doesn't work or you want just a little bit of a backup uh, for small purchases, uh, we actually recommend that you just take your debit card to an ATM upon arrival. There is usually a fee there, so I would um, talk to your uh, provider about that fee prior, um, but it tends to be less than going um, in the route of exchanging your money either prior to departure or through um, uh, an exchange company there um, for fees anyways uh, with such a low amount. And then in that case, we recommend doing like one to two hundred dollars at a time. Um, and then finally, the probably most asked question would be about tipping. Um, Scandinavia doesn't typically um, have that tipping culture like some other cultures do, um, but it's also not offensive to tip. Um, so with the rise in tourism from tipping culture, um, they have like placed a tip on some of the um, like receipts you'll receive at restaurants, um, and it's not required to tip at all. There is no base like 10, 20, 18 percent um, like a lot of places have. Um, so everyone has paid a living wage. So if you feel like a guide has given you exceptional service, um, you can of course give them some money. However, it's definitely not required. Um, so something to know when you're uh, budgeting for your travels as well. And with those tips, that concludes the prepared topics for this uh, travelogue session. And we'd like to go into some of the questions that you have about travel to Norway. Hello, Bonnie. Hi. Hi Hello. Hi. Welcome to our live Q&A portion. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Nicole, and well, and the introduction, Bonnie, that was really informative. So You're welcome. And welcome everybody joining us tonight. Uh, we have many joining us here uh, on our first Norway House and Borton Overseas Travelogue series. This is just the first part. We actually have a second part coming up on uh, Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, how to pair Norway with travel to other Nordic countries. So we're very excited to hear from more on the Borton Overseas team about this offering uh, and other offerings that they have. So um, I think just, you know, to kind of get started with some of the Q&A, uh, there's the white elephant in the room. And actually, before I, before I do that, I should introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Max Stevenson. I am the Director of Exhibitions and Programs at Norway House. Um, and it's my, my pleasure to have uh, Bonnie and Nicole here from Barton Overseas. They are not only wonderful friends, but sponsors of us at Norway House, and we couldn't be more thrilled to be doing this program with them. Um, but back to my first question, uh, the, the white elephant in the room, COVID-19. So um, I've seen a sub couple questions here, and I know many people must have this question um, as well. But uh, I think right now, June 1st, that's kind of the slate of reopening for uh, Norway. Uh, so what does that mean? What is What does travel during COVID right now look like to Norway and otherwise? Okay, I can take that one, um, Max. The Really what that means is um, once borders open, you know, the restrictions that they have in place today, um, we're hoping to be relaxed, right? Now, in order to get into Norway, whenever it opens, you have to be on an approved list of countries. Right now, as I said earlier, um, the, the U.S. is not on that. So what we're hoping in that open date is that the U.S. will be on that approved list. And with that, we'll become um, less restricted, like there won't be any quarantines. There will be certain things that they can't do today with, with tourists coming in. Um, I will say that you can expect that there will be some probably quite um, form of documentation that you'll have to provide, whether that be a, a negative COVID test or a document by your medical provider that says um, you had it, <laughs> you, are, you are now clear to fly. Um, or a vaccine. And those are the, the things that we will 
um, as we get closer to opening and when they announce it, we'll know exactly what they need at that time. Um, but you can expect the documentation will be required. But when it opens, we're hoping that the quarantines will go away and we'll be everybody will be able to go about their business like they did before. Yes, let's hope. It's always in flux. Let's hope. Right? Let's right? hope. Everything's in flux. So, <laughs> well, good. Well, I think um, now that we kind of talked about COVID, um, let's get to some of the, uh, these other interesting questions that are popping up here. And um, I think, Nicole, I'm going to kind of ask you a fun question here. I know you mm -hmm. lived in Norway before. You speak Norwegian. Obviously, you talked about this before. Um, we do have a question, though, um, from one person wondering where your roots are in Norway um, and if you would like to share that. Uh, come from a couple different areas, but the one I identify with the most it would be the Telemark area. And that is actually where I ended up studying, not really knowing until I got there that um, uh, it is Telemark as uh, Gvarv, which is a little bit outside of the city or town that I studied in, Bö. so okay. Telemark. Mm -hmm. Okay, very nice. Awesome. So I'm my, my family's from the Vos region, so. Oh. Mm -hmm. Not too far away. No, not too <laughs> far away. <laughs> well, good. Well, so since you've lived there, you obviously must know a thing or two about the weather in Norway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another question here actually about the weather. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit what, what that's like and like what, what to expect during the travel? Yeah, um, if you're a Minnesotan or I guess from the Midwest, it's not a shock um, to go to Norway. Um, it is a little further north. However, um, with the Gulf Stream, it's a little bit more mild. So if you're going to travel in the winter along the coast, you're not going to see too much snow, um, but you will kind of in closer um, to the Swedish border. Um, so you can expect kind of 70s and humidity in the summer. Um, sometimes they'll have rainy summer, sometimes they won't. Um, the same with snow in the winter, but they have the four seasons. Um, that kind of follow the Midwest seasons. Um, and it is a lot like Minnesota and you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Part of the reason why they immigrated here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, say, just looking at a few more of these questions, kind of just about travel. Uh, we do have one question here that was actually in the chat. Um, best uh, options for cell phone use, actually, and to keep costs down, mm -hmm. to have access to GPS and whatnot. Yeah, um, it all depends on your phone provider, actually. Um, there are some phone providers, and it depends like what type of plan you have, if it's a plan that's grandfathered in from five years ago, or if you're using a current plan, like um, it's $10 a day for using your regular data in minutes. Um, or you can kind of get a track phone and use minutes. I would suggest doing that here though, because when you're purchasing that there, uh, oftentimes they require you to have their version of a social security number. And that can um, provide some complications over there. Um, but so we actually refer each of our clients um, or anybody traveling to their phone provider for their best options for that. Okay, all right, good to know, good to know. Um, I mean, I, as I'm talking here, just more and more questions are popping up. So and I know everyone, we're not going to be able to get to everything here. I know probably just take five more minutes, I think it's a little bit over um, to answer a couple more of these at least. But um, I think we'll be able to answer some of these afterwards too. I think Nicole and Bonnie mm -hmm. have both offered to, to do that. So um, let's see here. So uh, do your tours go near homes of Grieg, Ibsen and other uh, Norwegian artists and composers? Um, or would it be best to plan those perhaps independently as part of your tours? Um, yeah, so we actually have done a couple tours for Norway House to include those uh, for some of their programs. Um, most of the tours that we offer that um, are in those areas are actually independent. So if that is an interest of you, we can actually put that together very easily. Um, the Escorted, um, they, um, Grieg is just outside of Bergen, so it's very easy um, to get there. But then when you're looking at some of those other composers and you're going um, to kind of areas, I mean, Grieg also can be in Hardangefjord because that's where he liked to write instead of um, Bergen where he lived. Um, so a lot of the tours don't focus on those areas, but um, so independent, um, we can definitely get you there. Awesome. Well, good to know. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, and I'm just kind of um, looking at some more here, and I'm going to kind of do two in one. Uh, question about Norwegian Air, because you talked about travel and airline. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this person's heard that they're very low in prices. They're actually based in San Diego. Um, mm -hmm. And I think they're going to try to fly from Los Angeles. And on top of that, actually, too, is the do's and don'ts of car rentals in Norway. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, for Norwegian Air, um, we didn't really mention that one because they're actually, they've been hit really hard by the situation um, of travel. And so they've actually kind of uh, taken away some of their gateways from the U.S., so um, we'd have to get back to you more on what their plans are for the Los Angeles Gateway and where they're going to be flying to. Um, so we can get back to you via an email specifically. But yeah, they did have a few gateways from um, the U.S. And that would, again, be one of those no frill um, airlines. Um, but a lot of our clients are from the Midwest areas. Um, so it really wasn't a viable option for them. Like. Um, Iceland Air that had a gateway in Minneapolis or Chicago, and um, same with um, Scandinavian Airlines um, being Chicago. So um, for the car rental, um, I would say that um, definitely get an automatic um, because of all the windy <laughs> roads. The hairpin turns can be very stressful. I learned myself to drive a manual there and uh, um, it was uh, an interesting experience. So um, uh, don't, um, another thing would be don't cheap out on the GPS. Um, they usually have them within the car um, and it's, it's really nice. Um, because um, when you're looking at a roadmap and um, my grandparents can attest to this, it, it looks like it's a lot closer than it actually is because of the winding roads. Uh, when you're looking here, roads are a lot straighter. Um, so it takes a lot longer <laughs> than, than you'd think. Um, so, and then when I'm talking about GPS, also make sure that it's in English before you drive away. <laughs> um, because I've had clients who are like, it was in Norwegian the whole time and we didn't know what to do. So th that would be my tip for that. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that, uh, well, so that was an awesome yeah. two in one question there. I have another two in one question that I want to ask. Um, a, realistic, a realistic budget uh, for uh, meals, let's say. And uh, what is, uh, I mean, Bonnie, feel free to join me too. Favorite restaurant in Oslo or Norway? Oh. Oh, I'm going to leave that one to Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> She's yeah. kind of visited way more than I have, so I'll leave that to <laughs> Uh, as far as pricing, um, it's definitely going to be a little bit more expensive than you're used to here. Um, I always um, tell clients to not do the math um, and just enjoy yourself because um, you're looking at about three to five times um, the cost there versus here. Um, so, but I mean, when you come back you're, and you're like, dang, I w wish I would have tried the reindeer hamburger because where can I get that here? Um, and you saved like $10, $15 for that. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, as far as favorite restaurant in Oslo, um, I, I can't even remember the place, but it was, um, it has, um, kind of local traditions. It's a little kind of cafe. I think it was something stua. Um, and so I can definitely email the person, person that, um, but if you're looking for, you can find anything. You can find Chinese, you can find Italian, you can find Hard Rock Cafe in Oslo. Um, but I prefer those kind of like traditional Norwegian when I'm going there because I can get the other things here, so. Same here. I think um, when I was in Oslo, the name of it. Was it just the, was it the Grand Hotel? I want to say just the Grand Hotel, but that couldn't mm -hmm. be. Um, they have was, a great restaurant. <laughs> yeah, where, where Munk and I think Grieg. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. They, the Bohemians, they all um, mm -hmm. paid uh, on that main strip in Oslo. Um, mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite ones. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, they have wonderful uh, menus. So. Yeah, Bergen, Bergen has some wonderful restaurants along the mm -hmm. wharf there too. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't even pick a favorite because there's like three or four right there that I'd go back to any day. Mm -hmm. well, I got to get there. I've only been to Oslo so yeah. far, so I need to expand my well, We can help you with that. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> well, um, I think I'm just going to take a couple more just because we're getting a little later here. Um, but there are so many questions, so I will send these to both Bonnie and Nicole after um, 
our webinar here, and hopefully they can get back to you and answer those questions yeah. uh, in the next few Absolutely. days. Um, but uh, those extraordinary hotels, can you remind me again what <laughs> those were? Those were fun. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have Ullenswang Hotel or um, Ullen, it's U L L E N V A N G. It's hard on Hard Dung Fjord. Um, it has a kind of a moat around it uh, where you can swim in a spa. Uh, and your room usually out is looking at the fjord and you can see the moat. It's very cool. Um, and then we have Kvikness. Um, that's K-V-I-K-N-E-S, located on Hardanger Fjord, or no, Songna Fjord, sorry, that we just talked about Hardanger Fjord. And then we have Union, or just Union in the English, um, located on Gaidange Fjord. Um, and those all have just those wonderful views of the hotels, and they have that historic um, background. Um, and those are the ones um, that are recommended in those areas as well. And is the uh, the tour to the historic hotels listed on the website? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. And are, mm -hmm. are meals included in some of those as well? Yeah. Um. Oftentimes at these uh, fjord uh, hotels, there there isn't much um, like as options in these tiny towns. So we usually uh, provide half board, which means you get breakfast and dinner. And um, at all of the hotels that we provide, we provide breakfast for you so that you only have to worry about lunch and dinner on your okay. trip. Mm -hmm. all right. Now, uh, remind me again, so the, was it $5,000 price? Was that, was that including or not including airfare? That would include airfare. Would include um, it's a good base okay. um, price for two weeks in Norway. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, is there any difference between the way uh, escorted tours work and independent travel works in price? I mean, uh, can you talk a little bit about, I guess, that? Yeah, so when you have escorted versus independent, um, escorted usually has a lot more like tours um, and uh, meals included. So you are getting uh, to be a little bit more expensive, especially if it's a smaller group versus a larger group. Um, so you can still use that as a reference point, um, but like I said, it's kind of it depends on what you're doing in there. Um, so escorted tends to be um, a little bit more expensive. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, we're getting closer. I think I'm gonna ask one more. I think this will kind of encompass a few of them that we have here. A lot of people are talking about family, that's in Norway, um, you know, at places that they want to see. Obviously, we talked a little bit about how you can kind of work those into your travels. Um, but um, can you help? Can you help? Can you help me get to my family in Norway? Yeah. My relatives are in Voss. I want yeah. to go see them. Can I? Can I mm -hmm. do this while I'm on a travel with you? Mm -hmm. We can definitely do that. We actually have a lot of multi generational and even genealogy groups um, that, that um, come to us for travel. Um, so if you don't know exactly where they're located, we have partners that we can refer you to um, to find the family farm. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we have that information, we can use that to design design the per perfect like custom itinerary that, to include that area as well as any other highlights you'd like to see in the country. So awesome. I'll be booking my tour soon. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for your call. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, say, um, I just want to thank you both again for taking the time today to join us in our, our uh, webinar together, the Travelogue series, the first part. Just want to remind everyone again that the second part in this series, this is a three-part series that we're going to be doing over the next uh, month or two, um, will be on February 25th at 7 p.m. We'll do the same sort of Zoom webinar. Um, the presentation that we watched right before our Q&A will actually be available tomorrow uh, afternoon on our website at norwayhouse.com, uh, excuse me, not .com, .org, but norwayhouse.org, um, <laughs> portenoverseas.com for information on Porton Overseas. Um, but the program will be posted on our website and our YouTube page tomorrow afternoon, so you should be able to find it there if you were... Um, if you didn't have audio or had a bad connection, or if you have a friend that wants to uh, listen to this as well. So I think with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to you, Bonnie. I thank you again so much. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Max, for having us. And thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. We know your time is very precious at night. So we really appreciate you taking the time to listen to some of our ideas answer your questions. We hope you got some ideas going in your head again. And if there's anything else we can help you answer, um, 
you know how to contact us uh, via web or via phone call. We're there to help you. So thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you all. I'll see you next time. <laughs>